So I'd like to thank you for the invitation to, to talk to you today. Um, and I must admit, it's a little intimidating talking to uh, computer science people, given I'm, I'm, my kids will tell you I'm quite a techno-phobe. Uh, so hopefully this uh, goes smoothly. Um, my name is Finley McAllister. I'm a professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine over at the University of Alberta Hospital. Um, so that's the Division of Medicine where we look after inpatients. So right now, half of our patients, of course, have COVID, uh, but we look after patients with pneumonia, heart attacks, strokes, etc. Uh, so anything kind of between the neck and, and the belly button uh, falls under general internal medicine. What I'm talking to you today, though, is about the Alberta Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research Support Unit. Uh, I've been involved with the unit since it was founded in 2015. Um, I was the data platform lead for the first five years, and now for the next five years, I'm the scientific director for the Alberta Spore uh, unit, what we'll call AppSpore U. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an oversight of AppSpore U. For those that want to just jump ahead, this is the website uh, for AppSpore U. So it's just appsporeu.ca. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the services that are available uh, to researchers from uh, any faculty, uh, any university in Alberta. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit of the data and services uh, that we can provide. Also, some of the capacity development initiatives, some of the events that go on, our patient engagement uh, node. And we have a, a platform that's working specifically knowledge translation or what's called the learning health system. So what is the AppSpore U? Um, it was established in 2015 with a five-year, $48 million uh, partnership between the Alberta Innovates, at that time, Health Solutions and CIHR. And we're currently in the process of waiting to hear on whether we've been renewed for 221 to 226. Uh, at about $26 million is the current budget uh, for those five years. We're actually part of a network of strategy for patient-oriented research or SPORE support units across the country. And to just give you an idea, um, I shall come to the network in a few minutes. Uh, one of the questions people often ask is, what is patient-oriented research? Well, the definition from the Canadian Institute of Health Research is it's a continuum of research that engages patients and providers, focuses on patient-relevant priorities, and it improve the healthcare practices or the policies to improve patient outcomes. As I mentioned, that's the CIHR definition. Uh, in Alberta, we've um, been a little less restrictive and we're really wanting to focus in on uh, research that's on patient relevant priorities. So outcomes that are relevant to patients. Uh, so that may be uh, some so-called tombstone studies looking at mortality or maybe patient quality of life uh, or patient experiences. And we also attempt to improve healthcare practices or policies to improve patient outcomes. And that's really the focus of the Alberta Support, Support Unit. As everyone um, is likely well aware, uh, it's been estimated it takes about 17 years for a research finding to actually make its way into common clinical practice. Now that's 17 years from the first positive randomized trial showing that the intervention works. So that neglects the several decades of work that may have gone in before um, that uh, in particular intervention or device actually reached uh, clinical trial stages. And only about 14% of any uh, published research in medicine actually reaches uh, a patient or influences patient care. It's estimated that less than one third of what we do in a general intro medicine service in a hospital is actually based on evidence. And so there's a lot more art than science uh, in medicine. And Abspor U is about trying to close that gap between the science and the practice of medicine. And this is just a schematic to show that there are lots of, of great ideas to improve healthcare, to improve patient outcomes uh, that both come from providers at the coalface, uh, from patients, uh, from family members. Um, but there's quite a, a drop off when we go from the initial spark of an idea until actually finding something that's going to change practice. Um, and AppSpore U really is about helping to facilitate that whole process uh, through taking those initial ideas, helping people design studies to test whether it works or not. Um, providing the resources to conduct those studies, disseminating those findings to the right audience and the right stakeholders, and then actually changing practice. As I mentioned, the Alberta Spore Support Unit is one of a national network of units. There are actually eight provincial spore support units, and there are also three territorial spore support units. The territorial spore support units aren't quite up and running yet, but all eight provinces are running and we're all interconnected. Uh, so for individuals who want to do research using administrative health data, we can actually put them in touch with 
the folks in Manitoba, BC, Ontario, in something called the Health Data Research Network to try and uh, facilitate analyses uh, between provinces. Um, as we will come to a little bit later, there are some uh, legal um, barriers to sharing data across provincial barriers. So metadata can be shared, de-identified data can be shared, but identifiable data, unfortunately, because it's provincially owned uh, by each of the data custodians, uh, we can't, for instance, send identifiable Alberta data to Ontario and they can't send identifiable data to us. The way we get around that within the uh, health data research network is we do the analysis within each province and then we meta-analyze or pool the data at the de-identified stage. So in addition to each of the provincial support support units for which CIHR and Alberta Innovates provide infrastructure support, CIHR also supports uh, seven other national um, networks. So one is on community-based primary health care, uh, one is on mental health research uh, and then there's five other chronic disease management uh, networks, which are on specific diseases. So there, there's one on diabetes, there's one in chronic kidney disease, uh, there's one in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, there's one focusing on chronic pain um, and addictions, and the other one is uh, around uh, child development, uh, particularly neurodevelopment. Um, so just to clarify the outset, abspor U isn't one project, it's not one program. Uh, so we're not about developing the fanciest yacht in the Monaco Harbor, uh, but it's really abspor U is an enabler for others, uh, such as everybody on this uh, Zoom call uh, to do clinical research and or quality improvement. So we're trying to raise the, the um, uh, what's the phrase, <laughs> I've forgotten the phrase, uh, raise the uh, level of the water uh, in, uh, the harbor for all boats, lift all boats with the tide. Um, there are four components to the Alberta Spore Support Unit. So we have scientific teams in four key areas, uh, patient engagement, uh, capacity development, the learning health system, and data and research services. I think the one that's probably most relevant for this audience is telling you a little bit about the data and research services component, but I will touch on those other areas as we go through. This slide, and Sabina has a copy of the slides, free to post them as you want. Uh, you might have to take up out a couple coming up with uh, Donald Trump's picture on them. Uh, but other than that, free to post. Um, if people want to go to this and actually see what's available uh, from the Abspor U, or if you go to the website, abspor.u.ca, these uh, slides are available and there's a fuller description of what's going on. Currently, we have 68 full-time staff uh, situated at the University of Alberta and the University of Calgary and Alberta, in within Alberta Health Services. And we have some IT support um, to help uh, researchers conduct studies. I want to acknowledge that the first five years of the abspor U, there were actually uh, nine leads involved. And so a lot of the work that I'm going to tell you about today was stuff done by people other than myself. Uh, I was involved with the data platform, but all the other platforms that did great work uh, were led by other individuals. Um, so what happened in the first five years of the Abspor U? Um, before we established Abspor U, um, I used to sit on CIHR committees, I uh, sat in the Health Services Intervention Committee, uh, and it was not uncommon to see investigators put in great ideas from Alberta um, and then hear people around the table say, it's Alberta, they can't get the administrative data, um, they will never get approval for these projects to be done in the two to three year window of the grant, and those, those grants were dead in the water. Um, so prior to 2013, it was very uh, uncommon to see um, administrative data studies coming out of Alberta, um, and there's been a lot of efforts uh, by folks like uh, Randy Gables in, in your own uh, facility, uh, working with uh, various parties across the spectrum uh, at the University of Alberta and the University of Calgary uh, to try and liberalize some of that data. And there's been great strides made in the last uh, five years, largely through the efforts of Stafford Dean and his group uh, within data analytics within Alberta Health Services. So the, five, the last five years, we've actually serviced over 1,200 requests for research data uh, in Alberta. Some of those requests have been simple counts of number of individuals with a heart attack in particular regions over a particular time. Some of them have been much more complicated where we've linked multiple administrative data sets, uh, developed cohorts uh, of patients, and then analyzed the care provided to those patients and their outcomes. Uh, other than the last summer, we've held an annual summer institute uh, for patient-oriented research to bring together researchers, 
students, trainees, patients, uh, and also policy makers to discuss um, uh, changes in the patient outcomes research uh, ecosystem in Alberta. We've, we've had over 265 uh, training opportunities now, more than 8,000 participants who've attended seminars or lectures uh, about uh, the Alberta Support Support Unit or about specific data science topics uh, or how to engage patients in research or how to translate research findings into clinical care. Uh, as I mentioned, we now have access to all 56 administrative uh, data sets held within the Alberta Health Services uh, Enterprise Data Warehouse, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes. Uh, we have an online patient registry, so you may see occasional TV ads at cheap times of night uh, for bethecure.ca or Albertans for Health Research. Um, and actually, those uh, have been used uh, with the current COVID uh, outbreak where we've been recruiting patients into COVID trials. Uh, direct with direct kind of consumer uh, advertising there. Uh, we've tried to increase the quality and integration of patient-oriented research into what is offered at the front lines uh, in Alberta Health Services. And as I'll talk in a few minutes, we've awarded 54 uh, graduate studentship grants. So these are one-year grants up to 30,000 uh, per student uh, to work on uh, data science questions or patient engagement questions uh, in the uh, uh, the realm of patient-oriented research and the kind of research that um, folks like Russ Greiner do uh, within um, Amy is exactly the kind of things that would be funded uh, under these uh, studentship grants. So for the graduate students on the, um, the call, I'd, I'd suggest looking into those uh, availability, but we'll come to that in a few minutes. Uh, anytime we offer a service, there is uh, part of Alberta Innovates uh, process is actually rigorously um, evaluating stakeholders and finding out how uh, we're doing. And so the Alberta Support Support Unit got a 96% client satisfaction rate uh, for those that like um, those kind of little star systems. Uh, so we're actually ranked uh, the top of the provincial support support units in Canada. Um, so we're fairly optimistic about our chances of renewal. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there are 56 provincial health databases, uh, which many of you on the, the call may know about. For those that don't know about, uh, they're all held uh, by the Data Custodian, which is Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health within an enterprise data warehouse. Um, so, for instance, we have data on what's called the Discharge Abstract Database. So, all hospitalizations in Alberta, uh, any individual with Alberta healthcare coverage since 2002, uh, that data is updated uh, monthly. So that data is downloaded into the Enterprise Data Warehouse. Discharge Abstract Database includes the patient's primary diagnosis, the reason they were admitted, up to 25 different comorbidities or secondary diagnoses and up to 10 procedures they had done during the hospital. Uh, we also have from what's called NACRS, the National Ambulatory Care Reporting System. So we have all emergency room visits in Alberta uh, since uh, 1998, I believe it is. Uh, again, coded for the NACRS is coded with ICD-9 codes. For the Discharge Abstract Database, it's ICD-10 codes. Emergency room visits, you have a most responsible primary diagnosis and then up to nine secondary diagnoses. So we can actually, for any one patient, we can link patients using their Alberta healthcare number. We can link between all the various data sets and build a fairly uh, comprehensive the profile of individuals with whatever target condition you want to look at. So if it's, uh, for instance, with Dr. Greiner's work, you may want to look at individuals with prostate cancer uh, and see how often they're hospitalized, how often they visit emergency rooms, how often the EMS system is activated, so paramedics are called to see them. Uh, we have access to physician claims. Um, now it's de-identified physician claims, so we don't have access to particular physician billings. Uh, but we have access to who, uh, to how many billing claims were submitted for a particular individual and the specialty of the physician, just not the names. We also uh, have access to what's called the Pharmacy Information Network. So that's been since 2008 in Alberta. Every pharmacy in Alberta downloads their dispensation records. Um, and so we have the dispensation records for 99% of the Alberta population. Uh, an important advantage in Alberta is that pharmacy dispensation claims, we actually have all ages. A number of provinces like Ontario uh, only have patients over the age of 65's medications because they rely on Blue Cross data. Uh, we have the pharmacy actual data, so we have all ages. So that's a, a distinct advantage. 
We also have access to uh, most of the, uh, the labs in the province uh, through Dynacare, Dynalife. And increasingly, we now have access to about two thirds of the diagnostic imaging uh, results. Right now, it's still text results. Uh, we don't have access to the actual um, uh, packs or, or pictures of the, uh, the um, uh, diagnostic imaging that's been done, but we can mine the free text. Um, and those kind of uh, databases, again, are all loaded uh, within one central repository. And people can come to the Alberta Spore U, we can help you access that data. Um, and we'll go through those steps in a few minutes. We also have uh, patients um, uh, basically their postal code. So we use that to impute socioeconomic status and uh, material deprivation indexes and link to the census data for those uh, individuals. Um, so as I mentioned, prior to 2013, it was very rare to see administrative data in Alberta actually used uh, for research. So this, these are research requests that went into what was called the Data Integration Management Reporting System. So that was Alberta Health Services um, Enterprise Data Warehouse, what it's called now. So prior to 2013, almost never happened. Uh, the orangish color here are the research requests uh, since the establishment of ABS4U. So again, ABS4U was all about creating this orange uh, part of the graph and having researchers uh, be able to access data uh, to answer uh, research questions uh, or quality improvement questions. Um, this is just a schematic for the last three years to show that uh, where those requests have come from. So we average about 70 requests per quarter, about 280 requests per year. Uh, for uh, data. Um, the U of A is the green here. So you can see about half the requests tend come from the University of Alberta. So investigators in various faculties, University of Calgary here, and we also have requests from Alberta Health Services. Um, prior to the establishment of the ABS4U, and Randy will remember these days well, used to take a median of 186 weeks um, to actually get uh, data uh, that was linked um, out of Alberta Health, if you got approvals. Uh, we're now down to about 3.4 weeks um, in from the time that researchers request data uh, till we can actually get that data out. And many researchers request the data not as just a data cut, but is actually analyzed. So put in and can we complete those tables for them, fill in the tables. It's actually easier for us if we do the analysis within the apps for you um, from Health Information Act uh, reasons, but there is the facility for sophisticated analysts like yourself to actually ask for data cuts. And as long as it's de-identified data, as long as it has health ethics board approval, and as long as there's a signed data disclosure agreement, um, then we, we can get that data out to individuals. In 2015, we had access to 16 of the databases. Now we're up to actually 58 because uh, now we have access to the new um, supposed to be pan-provincial uh, inpatient electronic medical record called Connect Care. Um, it hasn't ruled pan-provincially because COVID came along and slowed that down, but it's, it's active at the University Hospital, the Stollery Hospital, and some of the smaller hospitals around Edmonton now like Sturgeon, uh, Westview, um, Strathcona, etc. And not yet active at the Royal Hospital or down in Calgary. Again, reminder of the, the website. Um, and as I mentioned, if you go to the website, if you click on data and services, it will take you to another page where there is a description. Uh, there's some hyperlinks to describe some of the stuff that I've been talking about and some of the services available. Uh, there's also a hyperlink to the actual application process. Uh, sorry. Um, so you can fill out the application. Before people fill out the application, we ask that they have ethics board approval in place. Um, and it can be from the U of A, it can be from the U of C, uh, or from the Consolidated uh, Health Services Research um, Board for Alberta that's run by Alberta Innovates. So as long as there is an ethics board that has approved the data, uh, the uh, research project, then you can initiate the process to actually request the data. Our team will actually help you with the data disclosure agreement. Um, and that's just a contract that's signed between the principal investigator and uh, Alberta Health Services, uh, confirming that the principal investigator is going to use the data for the purpose they set out um, in the application and not for some other reason. Uh, and again, that's just a, a legal requirement. Every province has that. Uh, and it's not anything um, untoward or nefarious that's unique to Alberta. Um, 
So what are the vision and goals? So really the vision for Upspore U has is, is really been about bridging that gap we talked about between the research evidence and healthcare practice to look to improve the quality of care, the experiences of patients and providers and the efficiency of the health system. So for the first five years, we were really trying to build capacity. Uh, we were hiring the analysts, we were training the analysts, we were doing uh, the 1200 requests um, and we were establishing some preliminary partnerships. In the next five years, we really want to mobilize that capacity much more uh, to actually achieve some demonstrable impacts uh, within the Alberta healthcare ecosystem or what we call, or what we're trying to call a learning health system in Alberta. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a learning health system. Uh, clarification that sometimes people think Abspor U is just for research, but it's also for quality improvement. Uh, you may remember this press conference where uh, President Trump was speculating on potential cures for COVID. Uh, that didn't pan out in, in clinical trials. Uh, so really the goal of Aspor U is about the quadruple aim in healthcare. So we want to improve patient care, we want to improve population health, we want to improve the satisfaction of patients and providers, and we want to reduce the, the cost of uh, care. And that dovetails exactly with what Alberta Health Services wants to do as well and what Alberta Health wants to do. Um, so I mentioned a learning health system. So what's a learning health system? Well, a learning health system is one where there's critically appraised external evidence, rather than waiting for 17 years for it to filter its way into, into um, common everyday practice, we actually prime the pump and get that evidence to the bedside a little faster. We then monitor what happens in clinical care, how that evidence is uh, applied. Um, we identify whether or um, areas of gaps in the knowledge in the evidence base so that it can cat um, um, catalyze other research uh, to address those gaps or we address where we've, we have gaps and not translating the knowledge well enough into clinical care or challenges in applying that evidence, feed that back into the system. And it's a continuous iterative loop to try and improve the quality of healthcare and ultimately the outcomes uh, for patients. Um, we're work in close concert with the strategic clinical networks, Alberta Health Services, um, the Alberta Medical Association, the um, various universities in the provinces, the Provincial Continuous Professional Development uh, Committees. So this is uh, physicians, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, pharmacists, et cetera. We work with the Alberta Primary Care Research Network because uh, of course, Alberta Health Services only deals with inpatient care or emergency room care. Uh, but 80% of care offered in Alberta is in the primary care um, uh, venues. Health Quality Council of Alberta, and we work with Alberta Innovates, particularly with their digital health innovation and virtual care strategies. Um, so as I mentioned, our clients, more than half of them have been the University of Alberta investigators thus far. A lot of them, this is 80 out of, I forget the uh, denominator here, uh, but clearly it's more than half are academic investigators. Um, and so this is definitely a resource that's open to people within AMI um, to try uh, to come and, and we can hopefully uh, improve your access to some of the health data, uh, the administrative health data anyway. Uh, we're disease agnostic. Um, there's no requirement uh, that somebody has a project that fits in a priority area for Alberta Health Services. Um, we do, when we break down uh, our projects across uh, what are called the strategic clinical networks, you can see there's a mix from addiction and mental health, cardiovascular health, cancer, uh, kidney health, uh, the population public and indigenous uh, SCN was just launched this year. So that's why there haven't been any projects there from there, primary health care, respiratory health surgery. So we, we cross a number of boundaries. Um, our partners for the first five years, the Alberta Support Support Unit, where really Alberta Innovates, Alberta Health Services, Alberta Health, and the various universities in the province. Uh, for Avspor 2.0, we want to have a much larger tent. Um, and so we want um, to try and engage folks at Amy uh, much more. Um, we want to see more collaborative um, efforts. And, and our, again, our goal is to help you guys do the research you want to do. Uh, there's no requirement that any project that has asked for for you assistance needs to have an for you investigator's name on it. Uh, in fact, most of the studies we leave just with the principal investigator and their team. Uh, we're also working with the Real World Evidence Alliance, which is a, um, a, a conglomeration between the U of A, the University of Calgary, and the Institute 
Institute of Health Economics, uh, where they're doing some phase four post-marketing surveillance studies, a lot for industrial partners uh, or for the uh, Canadian uh, CADETH, um, the drug uh, safety uh, network as well. Uh, we work with various proponents of the provincial learning health system. So I, I mentioned already Alberta Health Services and the Alberta Pickin, which is the primary care research group. Uh, the Alberta Medical Association, Choosing Wisely Alberta, Health Quality Council of Alberta, et cetera. And we're also linked in nationally with other um, strategies for patient-oriented research um, entities. And so we can put people in contact with folks in other provinces. As I mentioned early on, there's four key components. Uh, most relevant to this audience is probably the, the data science and research services. Uh, so we'll assist people with primary data collection studies, but a lot of the requests we get are for secondary use data studies. So taking the 56 or 58 now administrative health data sets, uh, linking those data and then providing that to investigators or providing the results of the analysis to the investigators. Uh, we have some capacity, uh, small and developing in health economics. And increasingly, we'd really like to, to get some partnerships with folks at AMU as we start to try and uh, mine some of the electronic medical records. So Connect Care launched at the University Hospital and Stollery Children's Hospital in November of 2019, I guess. Um, and it's supposed to launch at the Royal Alex later this spring, and then it will move down to Calgary in the fall of 2021. So eventually the proposal is all 94 acute care hospitals in Alberta will be on the same electronic medical record. Um, so we can try and it's an EPIC based uh, electronic medical record. So we are working with EPIC to try and uh, figure out some of the um, the vagaries of the way they have coded their electronic medical record. Um, so any assistance, or if people want to do research studies, this is a developing field that would really be enthusiastic uh, to support. I mentioned the learning health system, capacity development. Again, that's those graduate studentships, which anybody uh, who's a grad student at an Alberta university would be eligible to apply for. Um, there's about a 20% success rate. Uh, we usually have about uh, 40 applications per year. And then there's a, a separate committee within Alberta Innovates that uh, develop, that uh, ranks those separate from the Alberta Sports Support Unit. We just provide the, the salary support and Alberta Innovates ranks those uh, proposals uh, using their usual processes. Um, and then there is work with patient engagement. So if Amy investigators wanted to engage with patients with particular conditions to determine either patient identified priorities uh, or uh, questions that uh, trouble patients or their caregivers, uh, we can put you in touch with that group that uh, works uh, with uh, a number of patient uh, groups around the province, um, including the group for research and with indigenous persons at the University of Calgary um, and the um, patient engagement uh, research groups uh, within Alberta Health Services for uh, the various uh, medical conditions. Uh, that's just a, a slide, not so much for this audience, but some uh, audiences ask about the, the governance structure. Uh, you notice the VPs of research from the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, Alberta Health Services and Alberta Innovates are all part of the executive committee as along with the patient partner and they provide oversight to make sure that we're actually uh, doing what we said we would do uh, within the Alberta Support Support Unit in terms of supporting research from investigators in Alberta uh, addressing patient relevant uh, questions and addressing priorities for the healthcare system or our patients. This slide again, just showing uh, what we uh, offer. Again, that's available on the website and easier to read than on here. Uh, how to access those services. Again, the website, um, keep coming back to it because that's such a nice picture. Um, and it's about as far as any of us can travel <laughs> uh, until COVID is, is uh, settled down. Uh, so who's eligible for ABS4U uh, services and resources support? Uh, so basically it's very broad. Any researcher at an Alberta-based uh, university uh, who wants, um, uh, who has a project that has ethics approval um, and uh, comes to the, the portal, uh, people are asked to fill out, uh, there's a service application. It's a cut and paste, very much like an ethics uh, form, but a little bit less uh, emphasis on the methods of the study and a little more uh, emphasis on what exactly people are asking for. Uh, and as I say, sometimes people will come in in the last four uh, defined cohort of patients. 
uh, released to them in de-identified form. So patients' names, exact date of birth, and personal health care number and address stripped off. Um, but yeah, otherwise, uh, with all the other linkage of the data sets, um, so sometimes people want just the data provided, um, and that can be done, or sometimes people will send us the blank tables and ask that the analysts uh, complete the analysis. Um, and we have two PhD level biostatisticians, biostatisticians. we have 11 master's trained uh, data analysts, so we can uh, deal with most of the, the simple requests. Uh, we don't uh, have the capacity to do, do, do anything in the machine learning or artificial intelligence field, so we would we would uh, leave that to the experts uh, on the other side of the screen. Um, again, another slide just talking about what can be um, offered. So everything from assistance with initial research design. So we do have people that come to us before they submit a grant. Um, partly they may be looking to um, flesh out their team with other experts elsewhere in the province. And we have a, a fairly comprehensive list and we can usually try and connect people. Um, or they just may want a couple of paragraphs written for the grant around sample size and the biostatistical plan. Uh, we provide support letters. Um, we do ask that um, we get the request a week or two before the deadline. Um, it's not uncommon that I get a flood of emails the night before. Um, so far I've got to most of them, but there may be days I'm in may not actually answer my email. So if you give us a couple of weeks, it'd be much better. Uh, as I mentioned, data management, so extraction of data, linkage, cleaning of the data, uh, and then provision of the data or the analysis done within um, the uh, platform itself. Uh, the process so people put that request into the website. Um, it goes to a case manager in Alberta Innovates. So again, this is part of Alberta Innovates oversight of the Alberta Sports Support Unit. Um, and that case manager is really looking to make sure is it an Alberta based investigator from an Alberta institution uh, and does it have ethics approval? If it does, then they'll pass it on for review to AppSpore-U where we really then um, uh, allocate the resources. The eligibility criteria, as I mentioned, if you're from Alberta, you wanna investigate things in Alberta and you have approval, we're gonna pass it. There are some selection criteria that are applied. There are particular times of the year we get swamped. Um, so if a project comes in that has a clear linkage uh, with uh, patients uh, or the health system, and there's clear feedback where there'll be stakeholders involved in the process and in implementing the results, uh, then we tend to prioritize those a little bit higher uh, than if somebody's doing some blue sky thinking. Um, not to say we don't support the blue sky thinking, but if something has a much uh, more feasible um, plan and it looks like it's actually going to um, have some impact, whether it's positive or negative, the study, then uh, it tends to get ranked a little higher in terms of timing. Um, this is just showing that people put their requests into the, uh, the intake portal uh, on the web. And sometimes people say they want data assistance and actually what they want is more help with study design or methods. And so things, some, sometimes you'll put a request in for one particular platform and may get reassigned within apps for you. Sometimes you may get contacted by multiple platforms saying, hey, we can help with this and this is what we can offer, et cetera. Um, people ask about cost. So up until March uh, 31st, we still have uh, the large budget from CIHR in the first iteration. So we've been doing the projects for free. Uh, after April 1st, unfortunately, CIHR cut our budget 46% and Alberta Innovates cut our budget 67%. So we're gonna have to go to charging investigators the uh, fee recovery. Uh, having said that, um, Alberta Health Service, who's the custodian for the administrative data, uh, are covering all the server fees, so you're not getting uh, charged. If anyone has experience going to ICES or some of the other uh, sites in the country, you'll get charged a uh, set fee uh, for you for uh, IT support within uh, ICES. We're not doing that. We're only charging people for the actual analyst time. Uh, most projects can usually be done between five and $15,000, depending on how many data sets you want linked, how many years, uh, and how much uh, complex, uh, how complex the data is. As I mentioned, the last uh, 12 months, we've completed 217 requests. Uh, when we did this slide, the median completion was about five and a half weeks. Uh, and again, no requirement for including any of the personnel as co-authors. 
Um, we really buy into the Harry Truman quote about uh, a lot can be accomplished if people don't get tied up on who gets the credit. So we're more than happy for the PI to be the only, uh, or the PI's team to be the only uh, named investigators on a uh, project. Uh, capacity development is another thing that you can check out on the website. As I mentioned, the graduate studentships may be uh, of interest to some uh, graduate students within Amy. Um, the application deadline is October each year, so we'll come up again next October, uh, and it's a one-year award um, administered by Alberta Innovates um, and using the Alberta Innovates processes. So um, we pay for these grad students, but we don't. We're not involved in the uh, selection of the grad students. Again, to be arm's length, so Alberta Innovates does that through their usual processes. And as probably everybody on this uh, call knows, Alberta Innovates is very enthusiastic about uh, digital health, uh, artificial intelligence approaches. So uh, if I was a grad student seeing uh, Amy, I'd definitely look at these kind of uh, opportunities going forwards. Um, that's just saying last year's deadline was October 23rd. Um, what else is happening in the data platform space? Uh, as I mentioned, we're increasingly getting into uh, electronic medical records. Uh, within Alberta, there are 400 primary care physicians. So again, that's a drop in the bucket of all the primary care physicians in Alberta, but 400 of them are part of what's called SIPSIN, the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance System. So they download their EMR data uh, into a data sets so that we have within the Enterprise Data Warehouse, and we link it to the administrative databases. So that's about 380,000 Albertans primary care records. Just a warning, uh, well, maybe not for this audience, but for medical audiences, the SIPs and data sets free text uh, field. So it can be challenging to analyze, but for folks on the other side of this screen, it's probably a walk in the park. Uh, we have access to Sunrise Clinical Manager, which is the University of Calgary's inpatient medical records. And we have Connect Care, which is uh, the University of Alberta's inpatient medical records. Connect Care is gonna be the one for the, all the acute care hospitals once it's fully uh, rolled out. Uh, the Centre for Health Informatics down in Calgary has hired uh, two machine learning, uh, machine learning programmers to actually start working with the SIPs and the Connect Care data. But there's lots of opportunity for collaboration if folks in Amy are interested in, in getting into these electronic medical records. Um, I will give a cautionary tale. We've had a little bit of, um, uh, not pushback, but a little bit of um, obfuscation from Epic around Connect Care um, that. Uh, some of the data that's collected seems there are some issues around um, the contracts that EPIC signed with uh, Alberta Health Services around what's intellectual property and whether EPIC will allow people to uh, analyze some elements of data. And there's some black box elements of Connect Care that uh, pop up warning scores to clinicians that uh, we're not actually sure what goes into creating that warning score. So um, there are some things that still have to be worked out at a higher level between Epic and uh, the VIN and um, Alberta Health Services there, but uh, there is the potential uh, to uh, use Connect Care data. And as I mentioned, there's the Health Data Research Network of Canada. So that's the amalgamation of the data platforms for the eight provincial sport, sport units. Uh, also the Canadian Institute of Health Information, uh, which holds the um, emergency room visits and hospitalization data for all Canadian hospitals. Uh, except Quebec uh, and uh, Statistics Canada. Uh, so that's just the schematic showing HDRN Canada. HDRN Canada has gone to the same one-stop shop for people to make requests. So these are requests for multi-jurisdictional research. Um, so there is a website dash.hdrn.ca uh, and that's the Data Access Support Hub and you can go in here, sign up. Uh, it's a Government of Canada uh, website, so just to pre-warn you, the password has to be 16 characters, which was challenging for me, but probably will be easy for everyone on this call. But uh, And you can go in there, you can request um, your, uh, same as the Alberta uh, Sports Support Unit, put in your project request, indicate what provinces you would like to get the data from. There are some hyperlinks in there to each province to tell you what the data holdings are within each province. Largely, it's administrative health data. Uh, we still don't have linkage to um, just the social services, housing, uh, education data in any of the provinces other than Manitoba. Uh, the other provinces is largely the same as Alberta, administrative health data, uh, mostly. 
Uh, so that's the Dash website. And so I thought I'd finish a little bit early and give people the opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions, easiest thing is either just email me at my uoberta.ca uh, email or the general email inbox for the uh, SPORE support unit, spore.albertainnovates.ca. Um, but if you have a specific question, just e email me, it's easier. Visit the website if you want for more information or for the Canadian data platform, the amalgamation of the various provinces, uh, that's their website there. And I'll show the slide since I think it applies to machine learning from my perspective, but yeah, yeah, probably yeah. Seen it a million times. I know that cartoon, it's a good one for sure. Right. <laughs> so thanks for your attention. Happy to answer questions. Finley, I have, I have a long list of questions that yep. you would not be surprised about. Um, the first thing is to, is to thank you. I didn't recognize until you put it all in one place um, uh, the, the scope and the mandate of ABSPOR in that, in that way. So I appreciate that because it helps answer questions for us investigators about where and who to approach about the ideas we have going forward. So with that in mind, I have two questions. One is, is that I've struggled over the last decade to get tranches of um, HealthLink data and HealthLink isn't in the 56 that you mentioned, but HealthLink holds an enormous reserve of, of very useful data that can help um, inform us about, about progress and outcomes of disease. So recently we got nearly a million um, health link data, but that was before COVID. Now the question is, 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 can you help us accelerate the acquisition of data post um, onset of COVID because the comparisons would be really useful. And the techniques we use are largely information extraction, calibration, normalizing the data, um, looking at distribution of the data over the province, that kind of stuff. So that's sort yep. of yes, no question in the sense about whether that can be connected or whether you can facilitate that. Yeah, yep, we can help. Um, what I'll do is actually probably put you in direct contact with Huda Kwan because Huda asked for the health link data post COVID. Um, and he tells me they delivered, apparently the system <laughs> went to paper only because they were too swamped. Uh, yeah, so know, there's another issue there for sure. So they delivered 46 boxes of uh, data to them. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 I should talk to him. Sure if you connect me, that would be useful. Yep, yep. So they're currently, he's got a grad student who's currently entering uh, that data. So. Oh, my God. Another source of, uh, of noise and failure. Anyway, we have electronic versions of pre-COVID data. Yep. A million, uh, both, we have both the um, audio data and the transcribed uh, uh, text data, which we worked on in smaller tranches before. Yeah, yeah, and that'd be the kind of thing we'd love to see people use. Um, but yeah, I think HealthLink just ran, ran the ground. <laughs> well, now, there's a, there's a general question about your observations because you've been a champion of, of calibrating the value of studies to uh, provide positive intervention on outcomes, right? That's right. sort of part of your identity in the yep. city, the province, and even in the country. Um, one of the things that the academic health network did in producing these two studies on, again, um, embedding the notion of a health learning system inside of the system, one of the things noted there is that our capture of health outcome data is nowhere as good as it can be because it's never been the case that there's a mandate for turning it back into the system with some analysis. Right. So. Um, do you have any things that first come to mind that you've observed about uh, new kinds of data to capture? Yeah, so there has been a move, as, as you know, they're now trying to collect more quality of life data. Mm -hmm. uh, so using the PHQ-9 uh, in primary care practices yep. and also using the um, hospital consumer, I can't remember what HCAP stands for, but it's basically that 10% uh, survey of 10% of people discharged from hospital. Right, so, so the outcome data from the patient point of view. Right. So, and, and there has been increasingly we're trying to get, and Stafford, as you know, Stafford Dean is a big proponent of getting some prompts. So patient reported outcome measures collected and included in the administrative data sets. Uh, so we're making some inroads. We're certainly a long way from where we need to be there. Okay, that I have, let, me, let me monopolize things for one more question. I got a gazillion and now I know where to have these answered. Um, one of the things that I've been doing with a couple of my colleagues is working on contact tracing because it's the 
de rigueur of the day, uh, people want to be able to make these predictions. Um, and, and we found two substantial challenges. One is access to data. So you didn't mention much about what the Alberta Health System Epidemiology is doing, and we're working with them under special conditions of getting access inside of the system to look at the health contact tracing digital records of people making phone calls. Those are really horrible, and we have all kinds of ideas about how to improve them with external data like TELUS mobility uh, data and all the kinds of things you can imagine. But one of the things that has emerged as missing is that we propose to build a short cycle um, uh, community at risk awareness map. Um, it can be a ge geographical or otherwise, but in fact, the data that captures whether you're Filipino or whether you're black or whether you're indigenous and all of that stuff is politically sensitive, so it's not captured. But in fact, we can't do the contact tracing and identify at-risk communities now without creating external linkages to external data. Where, where does that sit? Because it's a very sensitive issue, I know. Yeah, no, I mean, it is sensitive. We were um, initially in the spring, um, we were the first province that actually had allow that we were allowed access to the CDOM, so the uh, Communicable Disease Outbreak Management uh, yep. data. So we were able to get lab data linked to the CDOM data yep. uh, before the other provinces. And then, so we started running with it. And then uh, there was a directive from above that nobody else should get this data. Uh, and so our, our access got cut off. Um, I think there was obviously political fear that uh, something was gonna come out that was gonna be negative. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, the last comment is only that it, that's exactly the, the place where there's potential high value for the application of AI and machine learning is if it was just investigators hypothesizing what value would come from the data they're aware of, um, uh, Spore seems to support that very well and, and uh, evolution of improvement in that. But often we want access to as much data as possible um, to deploy search for pattern algorithms that um, are, are simply bound to find things we wouldn't find as humans that may or may not be useful. And so right. there's a subtlety in there that we have to continue to work on, I guess. Anyway, yeah. I've monopolized the conversation enough. But it's the kind I'll of thing- I'll send you some email about some other things that are helpful. Yep, no, that, that'd be great. And uh, we have for one other group of investigators doing some machine learning, we made one of their investigators, we got a, a agreement to make cross appointment within Alberta Health Services to get around some of the um, data custodians. Yes. That's what we did with the, with the um, connect, uh, sorry, with the epidemiologist is one right. of our lab is cross appointed inside of there. Yeah, and that seems to be the, the best way to go about it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not ideal, but. <laughs> no, no, but, but it's, it's a work in progress. Thanks again, in summary, for all of the hard work you've done to try to move the puzzle pieces as they exist closer together to make this easier. So it's the stuff that you, Stafford Dean, all the people pushed this for 20 years to get it to this stage. So <laughs> uh, it takes a lot of pushing, a lot of collaborative work things. Right. <laughs> Russ. Oh, Russ, you're muted. Russ, there we go. Thank you. Trying to repeat the comment. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk. It's amazing the set of things you guys have done and have all laid out. This would be very valuable slides to go back to and look at. Um, I wanted to drill down on one point. <clears throat> you mentioned that you do sort of simple biostatistical analysis, simple type of cleaning and things. Um, 20 years ago, machine learning wasn't this exotic, you know, you can't really do it until you have a PhD type things. Now there are pretty standard tools that do a pretty good job that make it a you know, a push button type of thing for simple analyses. Is that something that, I, I really share your budget constraint and so forth, but um, if we have tools that you can say, so this is an auto ML tool, you, you put your input there, you, you, this is a, the matrix of the, there was a patient here, the features and here's the output, and you push a button and it says, well, here's the model and the five-fold cross-validation and such and such. Is that something that you would like to include it as your tool at some point? Or is it that's still going to be, you know, uh, phase three or something? Oh, no, it, it'd be the <laughs> ideal kind of thing. And I think we're looking for ways to collaborate with, and as I say, get that bigger tent. And if mm -hmm. Amy 
was willing to help mentors in that, we'd love to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, well, let's have a continued conversation. I've been trying to push on that. Yep, well, that'd be great. I see that Carlos had a question. Carlos, do you want to ask your question out loud? The answer is four to five weeks, right? I'm sorry? For which? Uh, uh, how long I think is the volume application? is too low. How long, uh, he asked, how long is the application process for? Well, the application process, mm -hmm. I mean, to give you an example, because I still put my requests through uh, the SPORE portal. So filling out the application itself takes about an hour. Um, ethics for, actually, now the University you know, Health Ethics Board is actually much faster. So if it's a de-identified data analysis question, um, then often we're seeing approvals from ethics within a week because they're doing them under expedited review. So as long as it's de-identified data, no problems. If it's identifiable data, then it usually has to go to the full ethics presentation. Uh, but de-identified data within a week. If people then enter the portal, put the request in, usually Alberta Innovates takes a couple of days for their people to give it the rubber stamp to pass along. Uh, if it's a simple request, we've had um, instances where we've been able to turn around the data in two to three days, um, where people have come in with very well-defined, this is the cohort, these are the ICD-10 codes I want, uh, et cetera, et cetera, for these years, then it's, it's relatively easy. Um, there is sometimes some back and forth where people We'll have some people come in, put a request, and we'll ask, what are the ICD codes? And they'll say, well, it's ICD kind of thing. And uh, those requests take a little longer because there's some back and forth. Um, usually, when I get my uh, feedback, uh, I usually fill out the data disclosure agreement. That usually comes back within two to three days, uh, again, because the process is now well worked out. So it goes through the SPORE support uh, platform. It goes directly to the person who signs them for Alberta Health Services, and they don't do the rigorous review of them anymore because we've done the review before it gets to them. So usually it takes two to three days for that stage. Then the clock starts on the request. And as I say, sometimes very fast. Uh, sometimes uh, investigators will ask for some sources of data that we don't have. Uh, we do identify up front. Um, for instance, sometimes people want provincial lab data after the microbiology site, uh, which we don't, it's not in the enterprise data warehouse. Um, so we'll identify instances where we don't have the data so we know who to contact but it's kind of out of our hands how long it takes the provincial lab data person to to respond to the those requests but the stuff that we have the 56 data sets we have it can be within four weeks easily most of the time right that's very that's very informative thank you can you hear me yep yes uh actually i have another question and this is more in the um in the same along the same lines of the last comments of uh, Professor Gables, um, that how willing is the, uh, the health system to uh, listen to non-clinical uh, type of research findings, um, right? In your experience and maybe in your opinion too. Yeah, I mean, it's um, increasingly we've developed what's called the Implementation Science Collaborative. So it's a partnership between SPORE, the Alberta SPORE Support Unit and the Alberta Health Services Strategic Clinical Networks and the Alberta PIC and the primary care group. So now it brings all those people to kind of one Zoom table, I guess, nowadays, uh, where projects are discussed. Um, so it's a fairly open group to projects. Um, there's a process within Alberta Health Services. If So Alberta Health Services has currently 17 strategic clinical networks and they're disease specific. So there's one on heart and stroke, there's one on kidneys, uh, there's one on uh, inflammatory bowel disease and other diabetes and obesity. So it has a fairly structured process that people will submit a request or a suggestion for a research project and then it has to make its way up through the Alberta Health Services hierarchy. That can take a little bit of while. Uh, coming through SPORE actually helps I think move things along a little bit more because it can come to the implementation size collaborative. Um, again, we support research projects from any uh, faculty, from any uh, walk of life, so to speak. Um, so that part, we're agnostic. We're, we're not tied to any particular. Um, getting the health system to change though, if you've 
got a, a project that shows a big change um, and we feed it back in through the implementation science collaborative, they usually don't ignore those kind of things. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. Okay. Are there any remaining questions? Uh, again, thank you very much for, if not, then thank you again. Wonderful talk. Uh, it's tremendous having this wonderful facility. It's just in our backyard and we should, I know I've already taken advantage of it sometimes. I hope to continue doing it. And with now other people in the audience, hopefully they now know about it and can also take advantage of the wonderful facilities here. That'd be great. And we'd love collaborations with, with Amy. Perfect. Great. great, thanks. I like the thank last you. slide. This is really cool. Yeah, <laughs> I probably stole it from Randy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you.